Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, here at Parenta for our June webinar. We are so excited to welcome back Joanna Grace, who um, joined us last year for a similar topic. Um, but this, this month, we're talking about neurodivergent with provision within the early years um, sector. Joanna is going to show us all the kind of cool topics, but I know Gail's going to do a more formal introduction. I just want to welcome everyone. If you can just keep yourself on mute, if you don't mind, there's going to be ample chance for us all to pick Joanna's brains and ask questions. If you can ask those questions in the chat, um, we'll put those questions to her at the end so she doesn't get distracted better, because I'm sure there's going to be gazillion questions like we were last time. So Joanna, brace yourself. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And I know this is a a morning where we're all and the sun is shining. I don't know where you guys are in the UK, but I'm loving this weather. I'm from South Africa, as you could probably hear from the accent, been here 23 years, but still love the sun. So I'm going to um, hand over to my lovely colleague, Gail, who will do a formal introduction for Joan. Thanks, Adele. We are so lucky to have Joanna, as Adele said. Um, the topic she's talking about this month, it does cause confusion um, in early years. It really is about how best to help the children in our care, those with the neurodiverse conditions. Um, Joanna, as most of you, I think, already know, she's an international sensory engagement and inclusion specialist. She's an author, she's a trainer, she's a TEDx speaker, and she's also founder of the fabulous uh, Sensory Projects. Um, she's consistently rated as outstanding by Ofsted. She's taught in mainstream and special school settings. Um, and Joanna draws on her own experience from her private and professional life, as well as taking all the information she does from, from the research. Um, her private life includes family members with disabilities and neurodiverse conditions themselves. Uh, she's been a foster carer for children with profound disabilities. And she's published, on top of all of that, she's published books, quite a few books, actually, probably about six books. Um, we're going to put the links to all of those in the, in the email that you get after the, um, after the session. And her lovely son, Heath, has written a book, and he's become the UK's youngest published author. And his book is called My Mummy is Autistic. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, open the mic and introduce you to Jo. Take it away, Jo. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much, Gail. Gail, when do you want me to stop talking for the queue? <laughs> never. I never no, well, want that's to stop talking. talking. You don't give me a deadline, I'll just chat all <laughs> uh, day. Um, probably uh, about half an hour. Okay, right. I'll drink more coffee and talk faster. It's so <laughs> weird listening to yeah, that Of course, you can take longer. If no, you no, want no, it's to. fine. I think everybody's so excited about what you've got to say. No, I'd rather. I love like introducing you because um, <laughs> your books are amazing. Well, it sounds so weird because normally those those things that you've just read out, they're the things that I say when I introduce myself to people so that people know that I've got a sort of a professional background in this, but a personal background as well. So that you come at it from both sides. But listening to you say it all, just I just feel old. <laughs> Gosh, how has that lady done all that stuff? It must be must be knackering. It's not um, half of it, is it really? <laughs> no, no, there's nine books published, not six. Nine. Um, but I'm talking to you. I said that I would chat to you about myth busting um, sensory stuff and um, neurodivergent stuff in the early years. And I like to do these things more as a chat than as a PowerPoint presentation because it feels a bit more human to me but the risk of doing that is that I've got in front of me look at my beautiful preparation these are my notes on a, like a shopping list of things that I thought would be interesting to talk about and so I'm going to chat to you about those things but I know they've said don't bother me in the chat as I'm going along otherwise I'll get confused but if there is something that you're hoping that I'll chat about and it did pop up in the chat I would probably see it and switch we can, we can switch what I'm saying I was thinking when I pitched this to Gail I said I'll myth bust some of the things that people think are good autism provision and then I got up this morning and thought well which myths will I bust because there's loads of these things and then Gail said you've got half an hour like okay which myths are we going to bust in just half an hour so I think the the big myth is that when you're supporting a little autistic person the aim of the game is to make them appear not autistic you know if they do something like if they're doing something that is clearly an autistic thing like um not not looking at you when they're talking to you 
or um, doing sort of weird flappy things with their hands, then the aim is to make them not do those things because those are the autistic things and the autist being autistic is the problem that we're trying to solve. And so the, the big myth that I'd like to bust is that the idea that you have to correct any of those things at all uh, to, to make them normal. In fact, really good provision for neurodivergent people, for little autistic people would be to help them to be more autistic you know to be better at being autistic which sounds really counterintuitive but what we know from the adult community of autistic people is that that's really really healthy and actually if you think about it if you consider it against another narrative that you're probably more familiar with like um oh you think about um people growing up gay in like the 1950s. If you're the gay child in the 1950s, you probably behave in a way that is different from the other children. And people might spot that difference and go, oh, you know, this is a bit bad. They're looking a bit gay. <laughs> we need to sort this out and make them, make them appear straight. And it's essentially that that we're doing when we try and correct autistic behavior. What that little gay child needs is really lovely examples of, you you know, successful adult gay people and role models and representation and actually encouraging and support, not to be more gay, because I don't know that that's a quantifiable thing, <laughs> just like being more autistic isn't a quantifiable thing, but to be able to just be in their truth and to be themselves. So the aim is to support these little people in being who they are, not in trying to correct or change who they are. And Gail was saying to me beforehand, she said, these people like practical strategies, Joe. And I was thinking, yeah, that's great. I'll, I'll do practical strategies, Gail. And then I'm looking at my list there is no practical strategies on my list. But the reason that there's no practical strategies on my list is because every child is different. And the most useful thing that you can have for those children is an understanding of who they are and why they are. And then you create the strategies that match that child rather than if I go, what you have to do is, you know, X, Y, and Z, and then you go and do X, Y, and Z to every little autistic child in your settings, it, it'll only work for a few of them. So I'll go back to my first myth, which was the idea that if they are doing things that don't appear normal, aren't neurotypical things to do, that we should correct those things. And the big one is eye contact, isn't it? That's the one that um, everybody knows about. And not all autistic people avoid eye contact, but a lot of autistic people do avoid eye contact, especially when you're talking to them or they're talking to you. And when you're picking up on neurodivergent children in the very early years, it's often because, um, they're the easier ones to spot, you know, <laughs> people who, uh, people like me, so I'm autistic, I wasn't identified until I was 36, you probably wouldn't have noticed me in an early year setting, but if you've got a child in an early year setting who's sort of avoiding making eye contact, you'd spot that, and people think that you should teach them to make eye contact, and this is this is a really scary thing to me. I didn't actually realize until last year that this is a thing that people are doing, that they're teaching eye contact. And then I went to some primary schools near me and the little autistic children in those primary schools were being pulled out of their lessons twice a week to sit in the corridor with a member of staff and learn how to do eye contact. And I was, honestly, when I heard that, like the hairs on my arm, went up on end I was so just it was like ice water going over you like oh my goodness because if, so the logic is they need to look at you so that you know that they're listening or so that you need to look at somebody to listen to them which is only true if you're lip reading <laughs> for the rest of it what, what you need in order to listen to somebody is is your ears and autistic people Adults who you speak to who can report this in a way that small people can't describe it as um, like a signal jam to like imagine if you got static on your television or something that when they make eye contact, it, it does a sort of signal jam and they can't listen. Others describe it as painful. You know, and if your aim is to support good communication and to be able to share communication with that child, 
then you want them to be able to listen to you and you have to recognize, and then this is the next big myth. So, and it's a myth that I see perpetuated time and time again. And that is that autism is a behavior rather than a neurological difference. It is, it is a fundamental difference in the wiring of your brain. We can see it now in pictures. We can see how the connections differ, how the size of various parts of the brain differ. There's different amounts of gray matter and white. It's a different brain. It's a totally different brain. And if you just view it as a behavior, like they're not making eye contact, we need to teach them how to make eye contact when they're talking to people so that they can communicate correctly. But it, it doesn't it doesn't work because it's it it sort of blocks their communication. And actually that making of eye contact when we communicate with each other is just a social tradition, isn't it? We could just as easily have a different social norm, one that said, um, you know, walking side by side is a nice way to have a conversation. Or I bet some of you have really good conversations in the car with like your teenager or your partner when you're in parallel and looking out at a common landscape. That's a really good place to have a con It's a great place to have a conversation with an autistic person. But the misunderstanding is like the misunderstanding between cats and dogs. You know, you have cats that wag their tail when they're annoyed and purr when they're happy and dogs get pissed off with them. Sorry, <laughs> because they see the waggy tail and think the cat's happy and wants to play and then get swatted with claws or they hear the purr and think they're being growled at. And it's just a mismatch in those sort of communication traditions between cats and dogs that causes the animosity. And it's a very similar mismatch going on between autistic people and non-autistic people in that we have these social communication traditions and one group has decided that theirs are right and the other group is wrong. Ours would only be wrong if they didn't work. And actually, if I want to listen to you and I don't make eye contact with you, I will listen to you much better. I will hear much more of what you say than if I perform my eye contact, which I can do because I'm an adult autistic and I've learned how to fit in socially and how to do all of these things. But if you genuinely wanted to have a conversation with me and you wanted me really to listen to you, if I turn my head to sort of 45 degrees, I can take in what you're saying. I can focus on what you're saying. If you want me to look at you, I, not only does that mess up my ability to listen, it sort of, it's like a, a sort of tape machine chewing the tape. But I've, some of you will be too young to know that analogy. But it sort of it mangles what you're saying, like a poor Skype connection. It's like a poor Skype connection if I listen. But I also have to use up some of my concentration on on doing that listening. So I'm 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 not thinking about what you're saying. I'm thinking I must remember to make eye contact. I must, and then your words come through all mangled. So if we're looking to support communication in our settings, what we do is we address these differences. We say, look, this is how Bob listens. I can tell Bob is really listening to me because, and then Bob will have different ways that he shows his listening, probably in a form of, um, I call it stilling. When you see somebody's body sort of, it, it, they go still because they're paying attention to something. You know, I can tell that Bob's listening to me because he's stilled, but I'm not going to tell Bob to look at me. And you guys, are in such powerful positions because you meet these people when they are small and you meet these people when their families are very frightened. And these families will have a little person who is not doing the things that they expect other little people to do. And they'll be very, very worried about that. And if you address those concerns with, don't worry, we will make them do all the things that the other little people do. You know, we will make them make eye contact. We will make them play correctly because that's, <laughs> I was talking about this with my son. He said, but mummy, it's play. You can't play wrong. You're like, yes, well done kid. You can't play wrong. But as a young autistic person, so when I was um, three, when I was the age that I would be if I was in your settings, I was flagged up as a concern to my mother by the people who led that play group because I wasn't playing correctly. I didn't, I didn't play normal. 
And so when these families come to you and they're and they're worried because they're spotting these differences and you reassure that worry by going, don't worry, we'll make them normal. You've missed a real opportunity there. If you can go, don't worry, that is like that's normal autistic communication. And we will make sure that the other children and we'll make sure the members of staff understand that this is how they listen. This is how they play. Then you're saying, here, here you go look your child is different and they're starting out their sort of adventure with schooling and with life in a world that is willing to understand difference and adapt to difference and the wonderful thing about um our current age is that our understanding of different identities like our awareness of race and culture and sexuality and all of those different ways of being diverse is getting really good and an awareness of neurodiversity is another one of those things that sort of needs, it needs tacking on there. It needs to be a part of all of that. And I'm just going to do the words because they are very muddly words. Um, neurodiversity refers to all of us, you, everybody, having different brains in the way that biodiversity refers to the great sort of swathe of plants and animals that you've got. Neurodivergence refers to brains that are other than the expected norm. So if you were talking about children who are autistic or who have ADHD, you would refer to them as being neurodivergent. Sometimes people refer to them as being neurodiverse, which is true, but it doesn't distinguish them from the people who are not autistic and who are not, you know, who don't have ADHD and things like that. <laughs> oh gosh, Scales just told me to talk to you for 50 minutes. Don't worry, I won't do that to you because <laughs> you'll, you'll be lost. I'm going to go back to um, some of the differences and some of the ways that we can understand. So that thing about eye contact, one of the reasons why eye contact could be so difficult for autistic people is because we see in a different way. Um, and my best analogy for this is to think of it like um, the old fashioned televisions. Do you know... Do you remember when televisions <laughs> say, do you remember? And then I'm looking and going, no, too young. Um, you may have seen in photographs or <laughs> you can talk to your grandparents when televisions are really big and fat and they had like the cathode ray tube at the back. And now I presume you all have little sort of flat, thin digital televisions. Those TVs work in very different ways. So the cathode ray television, they throw the sort of image on the screen and the way that it updates the movement in the image is that it scans across so like on if i'm on telly it would look up here and go well that bit's blue and it's staying blue so i don't need to change that and then it scans across and when it gets to a part that's moving it goes oh, okay i need to update this pixel and change the color of this pixel and and it does a scan and if you watch the screens when they were on you could see a little sort of flickery motion going along as the television read its own screen and if you had a really fancy television it did it faster and it updated the pixels you know more often digital televisions don't work like that digital televisions take an image of the screen and then they only look at the bits that move so they go here's the picture okay which bits are moving these bits are moving so these are the pixels that i need to update so they're a much more efficient way of updating an image. They use a lot less energy than the cathode ray TVs that had to scan every pixel. And it's a really good analogy for the difference between autistic sight and non-autistic sight. In the autistic people, it's a weird one, like literally see more because we look at everything in the room every time so we're taking in all of the information that's around whereas a non-autistic person will use a kind of it's not a photo that you've taken it's a memory of what that room looks like and then only focus on the bits that change or move so in your settings and I'm imagining that your settings are like the primary school classrooms that I go into you've got you know lots of things to see you've got lots of things on the walls you've got displays of the children's pictures you've got toys there's a lot of visual detail in those settings and for most of the children in your settings they'll be coming in and looking at like what's on the tough tray what's changed you know looking at their friends who are moving around they won't be taking in all that stuff on the walls around them but if you're a little autistic person 
you're looking at all of it. And your vision is a third of your cerebral cortex. So it's a huge amount of energy that your brain uses on these things, which sort of brings me on to my next point, which is one of the ones that happens when people view autism as a behavior difference rather than as a brain difference. So one of the things that happens, and this is not necessarily a bad thing, it's sometimes a good thing, sometimes a bad thing, but you'll have a little autistic person and something will upset them. You know, uh, something that seems quite small and minor will totally flip them out and they'll be distraught and they'll be distressed and they'll show through their behavior that they were upset by this thing. And what lovely settings do is they go, okay, well, so what was it about him having a yellow straw that was so upsetting to him? Why, why did that seemingly, you know, nothing, what was it that happened that meant so much to him that he got so distressed about it? And if you spot a pattern, you know, if you spot that every time he gets given a yellow straw, every time he gets given a yellow cup, he has a big meltdown and he's distressed by it, then you figure out, aha, you know, something's going on with yellow, we'll dodge that one. He can have red straws and red cups. But if you're finding that you're getting these flip outs, you know, often, and you can't, find a pattern to them you, there's sort of no rhyme or reason to them people often say to me you know he gets really upset for for no reason there's no cause there's nothing has prompted it what can be going on is that those things are just like the final straw on a much bigger picture and you think about yourself when you're doing like 50 jobs at once which you definitely will have experience of if you're working in the early years you know you're doing all of this you you're managing those children you're remembering this you've got to sort the bags you've got to do all of this stuff and then somebody says oh you know could you just get me a cup of tea like, no get your own cup of tea I'm busy and somebody else looking could watch that and go oh well you know Julie's not very nice because she won't even make you a cup of tea when you ask. And I would make it. It doesn't, doesn't bother me to make a cup of tea for somebody else, you know. And it seems like you've overreacted to a small thing. But actually, it was a bigger picture. Because you were doing all of that stuff, you couldn't handle the making the cup of tea. If you weren't doing all of that stuff, you'd be perfectly happy to make them a cup of tea. You'd make them a cup, offer them a biscuit. You'd be lovely to them. And that making of the cup of tea wouldn't be a problem. And a lot of little autistic people are existing in worlds that are like that mountain of work. You know, if you've got all that visual clutter that you've got to be processing, if you've got all this social sort of milieu of all the people around you, even if you're not having to play with them or do things with, you're doing masses already just by existing in that environment. And so the little things that might not otherwise be a problem can send you over. And so it's it's a lovely thing to do to try and figure out what those triggers are. And, you know, if it's the yellow straw and the yellow cup and things like that. But if you've been trying to figure that out for a while and it's not making any sense, consider what the sort of the background workload might be. Oh, my goodness. There's so many brilliant questions. I'm going to stop in about five minutes so that I get to read some of these things. If I try and read them now, like Gail says, I will get muddled. I have talked to you about autism not being a behavior difference, about it being a neurological difference. And as I've spoken about that, I've given that example of eye contact and visual processing, which is sort of they're both connected to the eyes. They're sort of two different things, but they're connected to the eyes. That visual processing difference, the autistic people have to do more seeing is one of many sensory differences that commonly occur for little autistic people and for big autistic people. So if I do a couple of others, this is really dangerous now because I run the sensory projects. And if I start talking about sensory things, I will get <laughs> just two more senses maybe three, just two. Um, so a big one that is different for um, autistic people is your proprioceptive awareness. And I, on the sensory projects, do the famous five senses, but I tend to go to seven senses. And then it's like a slippery slope. You end up thinking about eight or nine senses. There are 33 sets of neurons that control your senses. So arguably you've got 33 senses, 
that if you were, um, somebody's just asked me in the chat, can you talk about interception? When I was going two, maybe three, it was interception I was, th I was thinking about. Um, my For my extra senses, um, I do your proprioceptive and your vestibular sense. So your vestibular sense is your sense of motion and balance. You know, when you're in a lift and you know that it's moving, that's your vestibular sense that tells you that. And your proprioceptive sense tells you where your body is in space. So you can do this um, in private on your own, but if you close your eyes, point your finger and try and touch the end of your nose, <laughs> it's your proprioceptive sense that you use to do that because you're using your awareness of where your own face is combined with your awareness of where your finger is. You've probably had an experience of your proprioception dipping just on the boundaries of sleep, either just as you're waking up or just as you're falling asleep. Have you ever had that sensation of falling? There you go. <laughs> and what's happening is your proprioception is falling asleep before you or waking up slightly after you. And for a moment, you don't know where your body is in space. So you're... <gasps> And it's a very high anxiety feeling. And a lot of autistic people live with very high levels of anxiety. And all of your senses can be impaired and can process information differently. So just like you could be sort of partially visually impaired, you could be partially proprioceptively impaired. And if you were, that sensation that you feel when you feel like you're falling, that <gasps> you would be feeling like a bit of that all the time. And what these sensory differences do is they sort of create a mismatch between you and the world around you. You know, think of that moment when you feel like you're falling. If in that moment I was trapped to try and have a conversation with you, you couldn't do it because you're busy falling. You know, this your feelings, your sensory information is the first thing that you think and feel, even if you know that you're not falling. If you feel you're falling, you're falling. You can't like have a conversation with it in your brain and say, oh no, no, I'm not actually falling. And so if I was trying to chat to you and you were feeling like this, you would be so far away. You know, it would feel there's a huge distance there that's created by that difference. And if you're going through life feeling a bit like this all the time, that's going to create a distance between you and the world around you and the people around you. And so autistic people get described as um, he's in his own little world or something like that. And there isn't another world that we get to live in. We have to live in the same world as you. And when we've got that, distance it's very hard to reach it and it, it makes it a very lonely place and the solve is really simple because it's exactly what you do in bed in bed you go oh, I'm falling hit the blankets to find out through a different sensory system where you are haha -ha, I'm in bed back in the room we can have a chat and things that support somebody and understanding where their body is in space will help them to make that distance between their sensation of the world and the world as it is to get smaller. And so what you'll notice autistic children doing is um, things that tell them that. So like if you did a lot of jiggling, if you did a lot of wriggling and bouncing, you'd get information about where your body was through that movement. And you might find that things that wrap the child up, you know, like a stretchy blanket or the, all the weighted resources that we have, they're all about telling you where your body is in space. I said I was going to do two senses in five minutes. I've done one and I and Ruth was asking for three. Proprioceptive differences. I'm just going to do them really quickly and then you can ask me about them. Chromioception differences. So we're way off my standard um, subconscious senses. Your sense of time, you, you know that you like you have a sense of what time of day it is. If I asked you to guess a minute, you'd probably get it reasonably right. You have a sense of time. It's a genuine sensory system. It's a sensory system inside you that sort of keeps track of what's going on and how much time has been spent doing those things. And a lot, for a lot of autistic people, it is different. And so if you're doing things in your settings where you're sort of saying to the children, right, we've got to start tidying up because it's near, you know, it's nearly time to go home with nearly, it's nearly snack time. It's nearly time to finish. Those sorts of phrases, that sort of nearly, or we'll do that a bit later or in a minute. If you haven't got a sense of time that's working, 
that's going to be really hard to understand and to cue into. So one of the lovely practical strategy, there you go, Gail, practical strategies, I did it. One of the lovely practical strategies I see people use is people creating visual representations of time, things like sand timers and having a little sequence that you go through with a child that is, you know, we're going to stop this activity. Because if you're busy doing, you're busy doing a bit like if you were busy at work doing something, if you're busy um, writing a letter to a friend or if you're busy cooking a dinner and somebody just walks in and goes, right, now you're doing something else. You'd be like, oi, that's really rude. I'm, can't, can't you see I'm busy? And they just demand that you suddenly go off and do something else. When you're small, that sort of stuff happens to you all the time, doesn't it? You're busy with your toys on the floor and suddenly somebody announces that you're getting in a car and then you're busy, you know, playing in the sand pit at playgroup and suddenly somebody says you're going to sit at a table. You're like, I'm not. I'm, I'm busy doing my work and children's work is play, isn't it? I'm busy doing this stuff. And for little autistic, that's true for all children, but for little autistic children, it's an even greater investment in the activity because the extra connections in autistic brains enable that um, incredible focus that some autistic people are known for. You know, you see, you see small children who will be just super interested in almost nothing. <laughs> He's like, that's got to be boring, but it's not boring in a brain that's got loads and loads of connections because this one, you know, piece of information goes in and goes, you know, five ways. So it's fascinating. And all of that brain is like in that activity. It's all doing the I'm looking at this sand and I'm pouring this sand and then suddenly goes stop. And it's like ripping your hair out or something is it's a really difficult thing to do so having something that signals that the stop process is going to happen is a kindness there I haven't talked about interception but I'm going to stop and let Gail ask me questions um, but the interceptive difference as you work out which questions you're going to ask me Gail um, your interception is a really unusual sensory system because it's the only one that looks internally all your other senses look externally and sense the world around you and your interceptive sense senses your feelings and so if you have difficulties processing your interception you can have feelings but not know what you're feeling so you can be feeling angry but not be able to recognize that feeling yourself. And so you think about all the support that you give little children with their emotional regulation, you, you're sort of saying to them, when you're feeling a bit cross, this is what we can do. If you don't know you're feeling cross, it becomes much, much harder, but I'm zipping it. <laughs> Sudden end. <laughs> no, thank you so much. There's That's so okay. much more to talk about. And um, loads more to talk about. <laughs> It's fine, we'll, we'll, we can carry on with interception for sure. Um, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions from, from the, beginning of yeah. the beginning of the session actually. Um, and it's about mimicking. Um, there's a lot of concern about siblings and classmates copying um, the autistic child stimming and other authentic um, autistic behaviours. What are your thoughts about this, this mimicking? It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because I wonder where the concerns come from. You know, are they... Um, you know, if somebody's doing, I, I, I know lots of autistic children who do little flickery things around your eyes. If you're copying that because you've seen your friend do that, you might learn what that looks like, you know. And if, if the worry is we don't want you to look autistic too, that's not, um, imagine, imagine it as the gay child, you know, oh, we wouldn't want you to look gay too. It sends the wrong message, doesn't it? If the um, concern is that they're teasing the child by doing that, if they're, you know, oh, you're weird and you're doing this, then it's not really something that you address as you target that behavior. Because if you sort of start saying, don't do that, then there's a tension that builds up around that child, isn't it? Oh, that's the child that we're not allowed to, you know, play with. We're not allowed to make fun of. We can't, you know, it's addressed through a wider awareness and we do that sort of stuff through our story sharing you know through the representation that you have in posters on the walls and things like that and it's it's tricky because you can't people people quite often say oh you don't look autistic like it, in many ways it would be a lot easier if 
if you could look autistic, if there was such a thing as looking autistic, because then we could read, you know, children's books and they'd be able to see an autistic character and you can't see this, but you still need the same sort of representation and role models and examples in order to present this as a part of natural human diversity and an, an, an acceptable part. And once it's understood like that, then hopefully people won't be um, teasing you by copying your movements. And if you're just doing copying the movements because you're interested in those movements, that's lovely because that's bridge building. And you could talk to that child and say, oh, you know, you've learned that from Bob, have you? And what, what does it look like? Because I've always wondered what Bob, you know, why Bob is so interested in doing that. Thank you. Thanks, Jo. Um, a couple of things about eye contact, which you talked about um, at the beginning of the session. Um, Ruth, Ruth actually says that she's never been diagnosed, uh, but she finds eye contact really overwhelming and it actually makes her feel sick. So it's, yeah. you know, it's real, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> um, but then, um, but uh, Leandri says there's a really nice article uh, explaining one reason why eye contact is difficult for some people. I'm going to, I'm going to find it and put it in the, um, in the email that we sent out after the webinar. The impact of multisensory integration deficits on speech perception in children with autism spectrum disorders by Ryan A. Stevenson et al. Um, published in May 2014. I don't know if you're familiar with that, Joe, but it's not one that about. I would have looked at from that title because that's a very deficit based title, isn't it? But if you're mm. saying it's good, then fabulous. Um, there's one from Kath Gibson. And she says she currently has a three-year-old that we believe has some level of autism, uh, not yet diagnosed. He loves his letters. He sings the alphabet song. We sing along with him, but that's all he's into. And when it comes to moving rooms, he really struggles. Yeah. Is there any way we can move, make it smoother for him? Yeah. So it's, it's how that information is being conveyed. And one of the things that um, a lot of people find useful is to use visual prompts rather than spoken word because if you are having difficulties processing language which is another difference that I didn't mention during the thing but a lot of autistic people experience differences in their processing of language as well as all the complications with having to look at people and all of that stuff um, and and the sequencing of time there's a lot of things that converge on those sorts of transition things that make it tricky but what you want is to have some sort of routine around how you do that so that it's predictable and it happens the same way each time and then some kind of visual support and it could be um, that it's photos it could be symbols it could be I saw somewhere scrolling past when I wasn't supposed to be reading I saw somebody mention objects of reference but that's another so an object of reference is a really useful tool for people who are not yet able to understand or for people who will never understand symbolic communication words you know little picture things it would be a thing that goes in the other space um but just a, a routine around it and some sort of other prompting other than language is really useful thanks and Joe. The, 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 they've got a three-year-old that they think is autistic um it would just in my daydream world you know this setting suddenly does like celebratory neuro it was just autistic pride earlier this week um you know you could have an autistic pride celebration up in your um setting like you had a jubilee celebration up in your setting because you're sending a message to parents that this doesn't have to be a scary thing um and it it is very scary for parents when their small person isn't what they're expecting their small person to be and your understanding of these things is always based on like a history it's not contemporary is it it's what you understood when you were young or when you first heard about it and the narratives that were around about autism you know even just 10 years ago are really really grim and so if people are seeing their little three-year-old be different and thinking oh my goodness they might be autistic what that word autism means to them is probably a very different thing from what our contemporary <laughs> understanding of it is and so anything that you could do to celebrate that and to encourage that identification is a positive thank you joe Bless it. I'll quickly jump in because there's the girls having a choking fit there. <laughs> you're right, Kathleen, you're okay. right, Gail. I will just quickly carry on. Okay, she's all right. Bless her. Um, 
we are absolutely this is amazing we've had so many questions so thank you so much i'm going to continue quickly so um little rascals have asked um i would like to ask similar to the above um for sure Oh, sorry, Vicky, Vicky first asked, how can we integrate neurodiverse diversity approach into clinical setting We work with autistic children with more complex needs, for example, self-injury? Now, this would read the next one because it's similar to that, but also with children with self-injury, non-verbal, sensory needs to put things into the mouth resulting in regular choking hazards. So have you got any tips for them on that? So they work in a setting where they've got more complex children and they're putting things in their mouths and choking on them. Yeah, I think it's a combination with children who does self-injury, non-verbal, sensory, and also uh, putting things into the mouth. Yeah. So okay. techniques. Yeah. So uh, the it sounds like a flippant answer, but obviously if you have children who are, who are going to put stuff in their mouth, then the stuff that is around in your setting needs to be safe to do that with. Um, and, you, and you don't want to be having things that are choke hazards out. I have worked with these children, um, they will find things that are choke hazards anyway. So you might have all sort of things in your setting that are bigger than your mouth. They will still find a pebble or a something. Or I had one child that used to eat glass and it's such a awful letter to have. Yeah, I'm very sorry, dear child's mum, but he may have eaten a piece of glass. And he like, you think that you, we were a highly staffed setting. We know what we're doing. You'd think it would be possible, but they do have a talent for it. Um, so what you are thinking about is the why are they doing that? And the whys for both of those things are probably very similar. Um, Self-injury is a, it's, it's an odd one. It's, it's actually a really sensible thing to do if you are being overwhelmed by the world around you um, and obviously it's not a sensible thing to do and I'm not endorsing it, but it makes sense for the experience of the person doing it, because what's happening in the world around you is there is just too much going on or there are stressful things going on and you, and you can't handle it. And think about um, people who have you know, like people who've been in a car accident or something like that. They'll say it was as if time slowed down. You know, I can remember every little detail because time slowed down. And what's actually happening in those situations is the stress of that experience and the pain that they experience in the car accident is causing a release of adrenaline. And it's not that time is slowing down, it's that your brain speeds up, like adrenaline puts your brain on a fast forward. And so your experience of time comparatively feels slower. So if everything is a bit much to you and you have something that you can do that slows it all down for you, you would totally do that, wouldn't you? You know? Um, yeah. I, I, Thank I, you. No, it's all right. I was, I was just, um, I was thinking, you know, how much, how much to, to, to tell you, but if I, if I picked up my arms, I could show you the, you know, the evidence. It's a, it's a technique that I have used many times in life and it works is the dangerous thing. Um, the only thing that you can do is try and space out that pressure. So what is it that's causing them to need to do that? And it's a very tricky one because it is likely to be that they're in a social environment and there's a lot of people around, that there are demands being placed on them, that there's visual clutter in, on the walls, that there's sensory stuff going on. There's a lot of things going on for those children. They are coping with masses. And so the response to do that is an easy one. A nice other thing that you could think about doing is to try and figure out substitute responses. Um, it's a really hard one because hurting yourself is so effective, you're unlikely to find something that is as effective as that, but you can find things that are good in a kind of maintenance way. And so I know a lot of autistic adults um, exercise or, or will do sort of, I know, I know quite a few autistic weightlifters, <laughs> not me, um, but, you know, things that have a, a, good, a good oomph to them give you a bit of an adrenaline surge, don't they? So other things like that, pressure work. Bless you. Thank you. Um, Alice has asked, and I've come across this myself with my um, stepson, it's asked about a, a child that they're really worried about who doesn't cope well with eating and drinking, barely eats and drinks at the setting or at home. 
and they're really asking if there's any techniques that you can help them or making suggestions of how you can kind of encourage them to wanting to eat or drink I know yeah. it's all to do with flavors and smells and everything as well yeah yeah um I do a, a training day called exploring the impact of the senses on behavior and this is always a massive topic on that day autistic people have sensory differences and if you are and you can't um you can't discuss with somebody about their sensory. you can't tell somebody that their sensory perception is wrong you know in day-to-day -day life we pretty much assume that everybody's sense you'd go into a room and go it's too noisy in here I'm going to turn the music down or it's a bit dark in here I'm going to switch the lights on and we in general assume that our sensory perceptions are all fairly in line with one another the only time we don't do that is with food and you have people around to dinner and you go is there anything you don't like to eat because you don't presume that their sensation of taste will be the same as your sensation of taste you can't um debate with somebody's sense so if if you have something that is unpleasant to you regardless of whether somebody else thinks it's unpleasant or not you're not going to be you're not going to want to be around that thing so like imagine if I asked you to touch something that was really grim like if I was asking you to touch it you would put most of yourself very far away from the thing wouldn't you and then you just extend one small part of yourself up up and like but you you keep as much of you away and like just 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 touch it like that and and you want to distance yourself from this sensory unpleasantness when I ask you to eat as a person who struggles with sensation not only am I asking you to touch that thing I'm not asking you to touch it with your finger. Your finger has loads of nerve endings, but nowhere near as many nerve endings as your lips and your tongue. So I'm asking you to touch it with an exceptionally sensitive part of your body, not at a distance from you, not even close up to you or close to your face, literally in your face. It's so invasive and so offensive. I'm asking you to touch it in your face, in this incredibly sensitive part of your body. And at the same time as you do that, I'm also asking you to smell it in your face. I'm asking you to hear it. And this um, is one of our sensory skills that we develop as we age, is the ability to tune in and tune out to sensation. So when we eat our dinner, we don't listen to ourselves eat our dinner, but obviously like it's happening here and your ear is here. <laughs> You can hear those noises. You've just learned in your brain to tune them out. But if I were to have, like if I had a microphone and an apple, I could do a really disgusting audio feed. And these people are people who can't do that tuning out. They're having to hear that sound, not at distance, not at low volume, literally in your face. And then you have to do all of those things at the same time, which is just, it like, it's like torture isn't it and then something else happens with the eating that makes it even harder in that if you are that little person who struggles with sensation or who who who's bothered by loud noises or who doesn't like particular smells there's normally somebody in your life who understands even if they don't understand fully they understand because they love you and they're sort of in tune with you it's normally your mum or your dad or you know your primary carer and when you're at the party and it all gets a bit much for you they take you out into the garden or when you're at the supermarket and it all gets a bit much for you they go and sit in the car with you and and the rest of the family carry on the shopping so there's normally one person with you in those experiences one person on your side in those experiences and with eating it's that person who does it to you and so as they face that assault of all those sensory challenges, they face it alone and abandoned by the person who is normally their defender because that person loves them very much and wants them to eat their dinner because eating your dinner means you stay alive. So that's not like malice from the point of view of the families, but it is an incredibly, uh, it's such a concoction of a situation. And if you have that family you know in the child is attending your setting they will be super worried about that child's eating and they will ask you at the end of the day did they eat anything yes or no have they drunk anything yes or no and it becomes a very binary question and what is helpful to do 
is to break it down and to spread it out and to um, make it more graded. So what I've done before is we've done um, touch sensations that are like food, not food. We didn't start off with food because these children, there is no cognitive deficit associated with autism. These, they're, they're not daft. You know, they know if you're going, oh, let's play with the baked beans. Let's play with that. No, I'm on to you. This means eating. I'm not up for eating. Eating is a stressful, horrible experience. I don't want to do it. So we were playing with textures that are food like. So you would say to parents, they have touched things that feel like food. And then we'll move on to playing with things that are food. But I'm not going to do that at a table or near any cutlery or plates or anything. You know, he touched baked beans today in our setting. He's he's put his feet in custard today in our setting. We can smell food flavors. We don't have to do that whilst touching food or hearing food noises. You know, we can, he's smelt the smell of gravy today and he's smelt the smell of um, what's another thing that smells fish today and you're building up all these little you know he's able to touch mashed potato and smell fish you know you're halfway to eating a fish and chip dinner then aren't you and once you start presenting it in those small step ways you give parents an angle on it and they've got something they can build on too they can play in the garden and make mashed potato sandcastles or something like that and it it takes the takes it out of being all about that moment all about being yes no but they still have to eat and they still have to drink so what you would aim to do in a setting it would be really it's, it's a tricky one with other children around but it's there's probably a way of doing it um grazing boards work quite well where you have a board of just small bits of different food and you normally put like dolly mixtures on one end or something like that something that's definitely like a popular safe choice option because that takes them to the board and they eat that and they go okay this was a safe place to eat from and then a bit later on maybe they'd come back and like eat a bit of the toast and do that sort of nibbly thing obviously if you've got loads of small children and it, like my son is currently at his nursery if you left a grazing board out in a room where my son was it would be finished, it would all be gone. Um, so you need like a part that they walk past that other children don't. Um, but you, the same for parents, they can do that too. And the same for the drinking and using, I'm sorry, I'm giving you too long an answer, but it's a really big sorry. question. Um, with the drinking, it's any way that you can get that liquid into them. So if people go onto my Facebook, there's a photo album of drinking games for children, which was just lots of ways that I used to use to get water into my children on hot days. But things with ice, like ice lollipops or... Um, yeah, little toys in cups that go down when you suck them with a straw. Just lots of different ways to access your fluids that don't necessarily look like a grown up telling you to have a drink so that you can playfully drink is a, is a useful strategy. That's amazing. Love it. Thank you so much for that, Jo. I, um, I think when I listen to what you say, I just think, oh my goodness, how many mistakes I've made as a parent. You know? oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 but I think it's a good thing because, you know, you learn every day. For me, Gail will tell you my favourite saying is every day is a school day. But I just love it. I just think, you know, there's so many things that you can do differently, isn't it, now, and help other people as well, you know. And you learn from your mistakes as well, isn't it? It's not in a bad yeah. way. I think every day is, is, is good that you learn from um, your, especially your exper exper experience. It's fantastic. We have got a lot more, so I'm going to just try and sift through. Um, we've got one from um, the nur uh, nursery, and I think this must be in Wales. I can't quote his head. I'm thinking that's Wales. It sounds like Wales. Um, advice on how to talk to families when they believe their child's statistic, but being mindful that their parent could be completely unaware and being mindful to not assume or use the word autism. Do you have any advice? Of, you know, is there any resources that people could use? Because I think I can definitely say um, some p parents is more susceptible and will accept it. But I think, like, for example, my husband's really struggled with that. So, you know, it was a real big thing to him to accept that. Uh, Callum was autistic so yes any from your suggestions yeah it's one I I I um had a little boy referred to me by uh he was he was going to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist began to wonder if he was autistic and referred him to me and I had a lovely chat with his parents um 
who who were perfectly lovely and friendly and I wrote them a note afterwards saying yeah I you know he's I think I'm not a diagnostician so it's not my place to diagnose anybody but there was lots of things about this little boy that were that came across as autistic to me and we'd had a chat and I said to him yeah it does look autistic and it would be worth exploring and all of this and I got such an angry letter back from the psychiatrist he said you should not use that word like what word like you shouldn't say autism oh well goodness why not I'm not insulting you I'm not I'm not saying yeah I, I don't like that as a piece of advice you definitely should be saying that word you're not you, you shouldn't be diagnosing you know you you're not a diagnostician you don't go oh, we've decided that your child's autistic but I think as a general piece of advice if we all go around not saying the word that just sustains a prejudice doesn't it we do need to be saying the word but recognizing that families might find that difficult so maybe we say the word and then we say and this is what that means to me you know this is what I mean by that uh, or you say the meaning and then you say this is known as being autistic um, there are some lovely websites that have information I'm thinking of the yellow ladybugs project in Australia so the yellow ladybugs project does awareness around autistic girls and they've got really nice accessible stuff um, yeah I don't know yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Didn't no, have... no, that's fine. That's great. <laughs> um, we have a few more, Joe. Oh, um, not a couple of comments as well. Um, uh, Jody says that one of her autistic children is, is responding so well to Makaton. So that's interesting. Yes, that's the visual aspect yeah. of the communication that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, brilliant. I use sign language um, with my husband um, when I'm tired because <laughs> it's easier that's it that I like that I like that idea um shout better in sign language but yeah um, Jennifer's asking is there somewhere we can go to find out more about these research studies you've spoken about um discussing the neuroscience I would think you've probably got some references on your website Joe, haven't you um yeah so there's an amazing lecture by a lady called um what was she called <laughs> I was, I was just going to say her name and then I doubted myself. I was going to say Elizabeth Blackburn, but she's the lady who won the Nobel Prize. Um, it's called, uh, oh, I'll find it and I'll put it in the chat, um, that talks about the brain differences. So these cross connections and things like that. Um, with regards to research, it's a really dodgy field, autism research. Um, I am... If I turn the laptop around, you could see I'm sat in this pile of books. I'm currently studying for a PhD. So I am a big geek. I'm very into the research. And when I wrote my book, um, The Subtle Spectrum, my husband was teasing me and going, a quarter of this, the pages in this book is just going to be your bibliography because I read that much research to underpin it. Um, but in the field that I work in, so I work with people with profound and multiple learning disabilities or profound intellectual and multiple disabilities. They're, they are described in research terms as the most disabled members of society, which is quite an accolade. Their research around them is very um, poor. It's not a lot done. It's not very funded. Um, so I regularly read research that's I was it, it's sort of of a low quality, like it's good research, but if you're measuring how good research is, you would want um, like you'd want a big institution named on the paper, or you'd want several big institutions named on the paper, and you'd want institutions from different countries because this is an international collaboration, and you'd want lots of researchers on the paper, um, and you'd want them to have done a study that checked what they were testing on loads and loads of people, not just on two people. And you would want it to be published in a peer reviewed journal and you'd want it to be published in a high ranking peer reviewed journal. And if you had all of these things, you would have a fantastic piece of research. So when I was reading the autism research, I read what counts as, and this is just an example, I read lots of stuff like this. Um, counts as a great piece of research. It was an international collaboration between three very well-known institutions globally. There was 12 researchers on the paper, all of whom are very respected in their field, um, names that you'd 
might recognize from autism documentaries on the television. Um, they had a study sample size, for like several hundred autistic people that they tested their work on. Um, it was published in a well-known peer-reviewed journal. So that means that um, other professional academics have read through this paper and approved it and said that it's good and it's worthy of publication. And the study was about the experiences of autistic people at transition from child to adulthood. So it was looking at people from sort of 16 to 24 and finding out how they did. And what they found out is um, autistic people are more likely to have involvement with the police during this time. Autistic people are less likely to be employed. Autistic people are more likely to have mental health problems. Um, autistic people are more likely to have experienced abuse during this. Now, there's a whole list of grim findings that you read and go, oh, you know, that's probably true. And then in their conclusion, they wrote, this shows that being autistic causes a poor quality of life. And you're like, how dare you? Because you could have done that same study on the experiences of black youth at transition. And you would have found a lot of the same statistics that black children going from 16 to 24 are more likely to have involvement with the police and more likely to have been diagnosed with a mental health, you know, all of those things. And you would never have written that being black causes those things. It's prejudice that causes those things. And it's the same within the autistic community, but that got through peer review. And that counts as reputable research in this field. And a lot of the big name charities that we um, think of as leading the way rely on this research because you would want practice to be research based. But the research in this field is so weirdly skewed and biased. It, it was useful for me to read that paper because all the statistics, all that stuff that they found out about, you know, lower rates of mental health, all of that stuff that's useful information to me. But unless you're reading it with that questioning lens going, hang on a minute, is this, if you just took it at face value, you would read that and think, oh gosh, being autistic is a tragedy. I've forgotten what question I was answering. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, think, yeah, I mean, it just goes to show you, you need to um, read a, a lot of different things. Um, and you're the, the, the um the documents you've got on your website are fantastic. Your your speech from the TEDx, that's yeah. a, that's really so interesting. I've, I've got three little, I've got some little mini training films around autism that are free to access on my YouTube. So they're all about seven minutes long so much quicker than this you could have watched all of them in the time we've been chatting um in my photo albums on my facebook pages there's links to lots of research and stuff like that the thing to do would be to look for organizations that are autistic led because not because um neurotypical people can't do this but just because you know that if an autistic person's doing it they are going to be viewing it through that questioning lens um, and organizations really simple things to like if they're using the puzzle piece logo it's not a good one <laughs> if they're using um identity first language so if they're saying autistic child rather than child with autism that's normally a good sign identity first language with an autism provision is a good sign within other provisions not such a good sign but yeah avoid puzzle pieces watch out for withs thanks joe um <clears throat> Questions are coming thick and fast, so I'm, we are going to um, get through some more. This one's about a key child. How can I help my key child who's going through um, a diagnosis transition coming into the setting? He needs a while without any children around him, squeezes when being brought into the setting. Do we just allow this time for him to become comfortable as we were doing? And um, that's, that's from Bo. Yeah, that sounds great. Yes allow that child yeah allow that time I love that he can come into the setting before the other people are around that will make it much easier for him um definitely for Mel she says uh, definitely interested in how you approach talking about the possibility of ASD with families which I know you've covered um several children displaying traits but what would the next step be and Alice Sinclair also um talks about dealing with parents seems to be quite a popular subject actually any good uh, sources of information leaflets to pass on to parents to explain and to reassure and um, also for those with English as additional language as well so yeah I um so the yellow ladybugs is great for the girls I'm not sure what I would recommend for the boys um it, the, 
I am not a good person to ask that question to because as an autistic person, my social skills are not that great. Um, <laughs> how you talk to the parents, how you create that um, positive regard around difference. It's, yeah, no, you need a different speaker for that one, Gail. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll put our feelers out. Um, a couple of comments um, here rather than questions, really, just to, um, just to let you know. Ruth says that she worked with a lady who's autistic who would throw up if she heard a lawnmower. We were talking about, um, about um, yes. uh, noises. Um, and also, Becca, this is interesting. She says museum supplies have smell boxes. They have smells embedded in them. Yeah. Um, she, she talks about the Yorvik experience in, in, in York. I've been to a few myself. So that's quite an interesting one to, to introduce the children to, to different smells. Yeah. I like that one. Um, Deborah's asking, can you talk a little bit about your experience with girls, which I know you've talked about the, the, um, the, the ladybug, the yellow ladybug books. How, is it, how does it differ in autism to autism in boys? Um, and as they grow during the tween years, how many children with ASD have identity or sexuality changes? That's a random question. I mean, it's it's OK. So the difference between autism in girls and boys, uh, it's a similar. Um, the neurology stuff is the same, but the the difference is to do with the identification in the our diagnostic criteria and the sort of things that we generally think of as being autistic is based around a male presentation of autism. Um, and rather than me mangle the example, the, the best thing to do is to look at the yellow ladybug stuff because I think on the front page of their website they have a like a list of 10 things like is your girl like this if she's you know like this then she might be autistic but I think the sort of the um I was gonna say the general rule of thumb but I don't mean that I mean like the general sort of um easy understanding thing is that people think that girls autistic girls use that capacity that we have for focus and interest to figure out the social world. It's like we study the social world as our special topic, whereas your autistic boy might be studying trains as his special topic. So we just develop a few more skills at figuring out how to blend in. But all of the sensory differences that we experience, the processing differences that we experience, the language processing differences that we, they're all the same as the boys. It's just the, the way it gets expressed ends up as being different. There is back to my one of my first myths was which was that autism is a behavior rather than a neurological difference there's a school of thought that says if they're if they're managing to behave normally if they're managing to fit in if they're if their behavior isn't challenging then they don't need a diagnosis and that's not true it is very very useful to have a diagnosis even if that diagnosis isn't going to be used as a ticket to services it's it's just useful to know what type of brain you've got and the sooner you know that the more you know the more informed I got diagnosed with autism when I was 36 and my best friend got diagnosed the same year with a milk intolerance and the two of us had been having certain challenges in our life once she knew that she was intolerant to milk she made changes in her diet she made changes in the way that she lived and she now lives a sort of happier and healthier life. And it was almost exactly the same for me. You know, once I recognize this is what this is, there's changes that you make and those changes lead to a healthier and happier life. And it's literally just knowing what the difference is that you're experiencing that enables you to do those things and enables the people around you to do those things. So it's worth um, being identified. Thank you so much, Jo. I've got lots of people who are saying they have to go. So shall yeah, we wrap up? I, I'm one of those people. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Joe. It's always a pleasure to have That's you. That's okay. Like one of our webinars, and you have been like normal, fantastic. So thank you so much. And from my side, and from, I'm sure from the rest of the team, friend, just want to say thank you for your time. That's all right. You guys, you've been fantastic. Just a quick couple of quick things. There will be an email coming out today with a recording that you can watch and you can show your colleagues. For anybody who's attended the webinar today, you can request your CPD certificate. Um, which we will send an email to you so you have your own records as well for today's session. But, and obviously, 
have a look at Joanna's website and there's amazing resources on there and she's fantastic in her classes. So I'm sure you'll be able to see a lot and get more, much more from us from today's session. So thank you again for joining us. Well done for making it to the end as well. Yes, well done. Thank you so much guys and have a lovely day. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.